I'm Laura Linney, and this is Masterpiece Classic. Last week on the Lord to Grant the Podcast, we revisited Downton Abbey Season 6, Episode 3, where, most importantly, Mr. Carson and Mrs. Hughes finally get married. And at the very end of the episode, Tom Branson returns from Boston to reveal that he wants to live at Downton with little Sibby for the rest of his life. It's a very sweet and positive episode that left both of us in a real good spot. So we figured this week, let's fly back to April 1917. World War I is strong. It's there. It's happening with Season 2, Episode 2. Uh, a lot of fun stuff is going on. We get some big debuts and some real controversial events. So, enjoy the episode. To World War I. Absolutely. Uh, We've been taking listener requests for episodes to revisit of Downton Abbey, and this is actually one for me, I'd say. Uh, Indeed. There there wasn't one that was attracting us this week, and and I said to Dave, what about that time that uh, that Edith home wrecked? I, I think it's time to, to check ben, check back in on that one and see what was going on with Edith and the and the Drakes. And just uh, just like it, with every episode we revisit, there's always some little surprise that we didn't remember is from that episode. And this is another one that is ripe. Oh yeah, there's so much more going on here. Um, but yeah, you know, just trying to see if there's any threads that will reappear in the next movie or something, you know. It, it, it's a memorable thing that Edith tried to, well, not, she, she wasn't, it takes two to tango, but she was involved in some home wrecking going on, and it's like, well, could this come back to bite her in later years? Oh, More than likely, potentially. no. <laughs> but who knows? It, it, it's our duty to reinvestigate the, these situations. That you are can argue so karma memorable. comes back to get Edith on several occasions. Oh, yeah. Karma's a real thing, people. <laughs> I believe in it. All right. <laughs> and for Edith, it's absolutely true. So is there any news in the world of uh, the Crown, Downton Abbey? No. <laughs> Not much uh, going on right now. Um, you know, just uh, entering the, 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 the doldrums of the news cycle. It'll pick back up, I think, once they start filming. That's and, true. And their boots are on the ground. Yeah, and I think the Crown, Crown is season five is filming right now, right? So, allegedly. Yeah. Yeah, so I gotta wait for Dominic going... West to be free. We got we need exactly. McNulty to be free <laughs> to to come shoot for Downton. Uh, I mean, the only thing that may be of interest to people is that uh, Matt Smith, who played Prince Phil on The Crown, they released pictures of the prequel of the Game of Thrones series, and they they show him with uh, that Khaleesi type blonde hair, and it's not a good look. <laughs> it oh. looks real rough. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah, well, it's happening. What can you do? So, anyways. Anyway, let's just get to this episode. <laughs> this episode, season two, episode two. Yeah, I was going to say last week there were so many updates that that you were getting mm-hmm. annoyed, <laughs> like all these fans with their predictions for movie two. Can we just talk about Carson this week? I mean, this week we especially got especially this week. Yeah, I, I want to talk about Carson, especially this week. I, I mean, do you want to start with that? It's it's so dumb. I guess so. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, last week we were talking about how uh, Robert was having some some indigestion <laughs> late in season six. Uh, this week, Carson's having a little bit of his own troubles. <laughs> um, you know, he, he weighs it off as nothing, but uh, it ain't nothing. No. It's, uh... Yeah, because he, he's, struggling, he's struggling to pick something up earlier in this episode. And, you know, a confluence of events leads to him having a, a bit of a heart attack. No, well, it's I technically that, not a heart attack, says Dr. Major stroke? Clarkson, right? Do they even, they yeah, don't even w- say w- what it is. It's just like an... <laughs> It's just it's his body Carson projecting the world, making a sound of <laughs> <laughs> whatever that is. Yeah, um, it, it, it's triggered by uh, <laughs> Lang, uh, the new footman who's uh, got PD- PTSD uh, from the war. He's not quite Mister Bates, and he accidentally um, spills some gravy some- on uh, Edith. Yeah, he pours some gravy on her, and that makes Carson go. Oh. <laughs> well, it all kind of happens at once. Carson may have knocked him into it a little bit. I'm not sure, uh, but Carson is is he's half the man he was a moment before. Yeah, and and Edith Edith has a great line in that scene where she's like, "What about my dress?" And they're like, "Edith, get out of Shut here!" Shut it. <laughs> no one cares. 
Um, and we get the sweet moment of Mary going to check on Carson, and he apologizes for making a, a fool of himself, <laughs> I guess. Mm-hmm. And he, he gives her advice to go tell Matthew how she feels about him. Tell, tell him what's in her heart. Yeah. Because that's a thing going on in this episode, too. Do we want we'll to just get, get to, that. to that now? There's really not too much going on in there. Well, what do we think the heart condition was that Carson was facing? Do you think he had some indigestion? Maybe he just... He, maybe he, he, he pooped blood, but we just didn't see it. <laughs> it makes me think of um, the, the, the Celtics game uh, where the, the one player... He, he like killed over on the court and acted like he had an injury and they, they took him out on a stretcher but he didn't want to tell people that he had to go take a dump and that was actually the truth of it but they had all this drama where he was on the stretcher and in severe pain but he had to go go deuce and maybe that's what happened with Carson here you know uh, he's, just over, he's overeating because he's stressed yeah or, or, or he doesn't want to be seen next to his lane guy so it's like how do I get out of here quick <laughs> and we see, we see he's struggling to open the wine bottle so like he's Maybe he drank that wine himself because we see people are turning it down. That's fair. Maybe I mean it, it's forever a mystery. What's what's the the deal with Carson in this episode? Yeah, he seems to make it. Th- his health is good until the very end of the show. He makes it. So oh, he is, re- rebounds real quick. He kips up out of bed. Oh yeah. Well, he just off his back onto his feet. <laughs> he takes advantage of his time being uh, being laid up and 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 emotionally vulnerable to tell Lady Mary to to go get Matthew. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as he does, he's like, maybe that was the play. He just wanted to oh, come yeah. off because he sees who's at dinner. Right. And he, he says, wants uh-uh, uh-uh. I, need to, I need to get Lady Mary to come visit me in my quarters when I'm emotionally mm-hmm. uh, messed with. And and my word means so much more because I could have died. Yeah. And Lang takes I, the fall because yeah. Lang is, is a nobody to us. <laughs> exactly, and he can deal with it. He, he he's totally got the fortitude to to deal with that pressure. Um, for I don't understand how how World War One worked, where you could just send someone like Matthew home <laughs> for whatever the, the occasion exactly. Well, I think he he's uh, a he's an officer, right? We see him in the trenches, and I think his his uh, his place might have to. So he he's home for a recruitment drive. Sure, he's in a whatever tour of, brings of the county back. for yeah. that. Mm-hmm. And I think they take in status into account for that. Yeah. So yeah, he he's back. He's back for a visit. Yep. Very very uh, lucky of him just to be called back so quickly. But he's not happy um, to be back. He's, you know, let's not beat around the bush. He's not like I'm. I'm happy to be home. No, he he feels like he you know he wants to be there with his men. You know, th- those are his boys. Mm-hmm. Even though he's home with his his lady. Lavinia Swire, uh, ay, 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 welcome home. She's come to vi- visit, oh my God. And uh, yeah, he's happy to see her. And that's not the only visitor down this week. It's the debut of the phenom, <laughs> Richard Carlyle. Yeah. and, and yeah. Ma- ma- <laughs> That's the crowd erupting. It's like the Royal Rumble, Rumble clock going down. As the, He's number 30, he's the only man left. <laughs> yeah, and then slowly walking his way out is just Richard Carlo. Well, who else did you expect? And I, I, I like that that Lady Mary's like, well, I've invited Richard Carlyle, and they're like, why? <laughs> What's the deal <laughs> with guy. Richard Carlyle? <laughs> Isn't he old? And they're like, well, um, he's, he's rich. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he he arrives, and they're pleased to have them have him. He's he's asking for drinks already. You know, he, he's just coming in hot, like ready to get down. Yeah, he's like, do you guys do you don't you don't do cocktails before dinner here? You just go in raw. You don't get a little lubed up. <laughs> yeah, he, he comes in loaded. It seems like well, he wants um, to come in loaded. He can't. They, he's give me give me a, yeah. give me a couple drink skis. Come on. Yeah, he's got to pl- play by the rules. And uh, you know, he sees the gravy uh, spill, and the dowager quips to him, "Never a dull play, a dull moment in this house." <laughs> and uh, Richard Carlisle is strapping in for the ride. He's like, "Yeah, I hope I don't get stuck with these people for." Let's see. When does season two end? It's seven years long, right? Yeah. <laughs> 19, uh, 1919. So mm-hmm. I hope I don't get stuck on the hook with this woman for two and a half years. And <laughs> does he? Uh, but not before he goes on a, a walk with uh, Robert and Cora a little bit ahead and him and Mary. And he remarks that he's he's feeling hot. He, he's feeling a little bit uh, steamy because he wore tweed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and 
And, and Mary's like, why are you wearing tweed? And he's like, I didn't know I was going to be walking out here and the weather was going to be like this out here. I'm just a man trying to make my way through the world, okay? I'm a newspaper man. Excuse me for buying this $1,000 tweed suit. Woo! <laughs> you slapping his shit arm. <laughs> Yeah, he's swapping his arms and he does a floppy fish on the ground. I'm rich. I'm Richard Carlisle. I like that every scene with him in this episode, he talks. He he somehow brings up new money. Yeah, to the point where like every time they old talk money. about him, yeah, Rosamond mm-hmm. is like, "Hey, uh, he was okay on the train, but he didn't look up from his his own newspapers." <laughs> it's all that new money. Yeah, it's speaking to him. Oh yeah. And he's he he even tells her I'm not afraid of being a self-made man. <laughs> he's not sh- he's not ashamed of it. <laughs> no, he says, "Are you sh- are you shocked by my bold and modern values?" <laughs> it's like describe those to us, Richard. <laughs> I love how he just speaks in the third person about himself. Just in case you weren't sure what kind of character he is, he's going to tell you the kind of guy he is. Yeah, like when you say. When you say like his bold, bold and modern values, and he's talking about ashamed he's being a self-made man, it's like, come on, mm-hmm. Rich. It's okay. It's I'll, enough. I'll, I mean, I'll, it's great. He's, he's a great. I love the bravado. <laughs> and we even get a scene of Dowager talking to Rosman, like, why does this guy have to be Mary's future? Why him? And and, and Rosman's like, could be worse. I can't believe that Rosmond is his valet, essentially the one who like brought brought him to the ring. You know, like, yeah, that's, how did that's she find the this guy? Sherry. To, <laughs> yeah. To old Rich. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that Aunt Rosman, you know, introducing Richard Carlyle for us all. Uh, and she says maybe Mary can smooth off the rough edges. Is he that rough, though? I don't think he's that rough. I mean, we see he gets a little rough he's with even, Lavinia at, later on. I mean, pretty much after that scene. It's immediate after that scene, well, yeah. after Rosman, like, sticks up for him, she <laughs> walks outside and sees him grabbing the wrist of Swire, and it's like, whoa, I think I may have backed the wrong horse here, I don't know. And he's like, I could end you now. And she's like, hey, is everything yeah, okay? He... He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Nothing's afoot. I-, I like how they bring in these characters, and, you know, they tease this huge interconnection between them, and I think we, you know, we come to find out, it's, it's not that big of a deal what he knows about her. Like, he knows, like, some, you know, back background story about mm-hmm. her it doesn't add up to much but alludes to so much more it seems like in this moment well, like there's something as, heavier as soon as Lavinia sees him she's like we kind of know each other and Richard's like oh we know each other well <laughs> what do you mean I ah, yes, know me more yes, 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 yes I know you yeah and I mean Lavinia has a moment with Mary where she's like yeah he has something over me I don't know <laughs> to be continued <laughs> yep <laughs> Who knows? But then, no, no, remember. no, you can't even say too big. Oh, that's too big continued. But the last thing over Richard Carlisle, Carlisle is great. Break it down, Dave. So they're at the train station. He's about to get on the train. Lady Mary's like, you're an all right dude. And he's like, hey, I think I want to marry you. And she's like, huh? Mm-hmm. He's like, <laughs> yeah. well, not, not, not. He's like, but do we, do we love each other? He goes, no, it's not about love. It's about what we can create. It's the power. We can, it's a very Sith oh, yeah. monologue. The power he, couple. He's like, we would be unstoppable, the two of us. And that, and you see Mary's eye. She gets a little twinkle. She's like, this guy. Because huh? at this point, we know Mary. Mary's a little materialistic. Yeah. And and, and th- this guy is like, I can buy $1,000 gator <laughs> shoes. I got this $500 like, belt. <laughs> Bro, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? What do you think about that, Mary? Woo! <laughs> and then and he, she is like, woo Then he, his, his music plays, and he gets on the train, and we'll <laughs> yeah. see him next week. Off he goes. But it's, yep. a, it's a great... Bit, I think from Carl and I think from Mary. Like we 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 sleep well, on the fact that Mary is interested in Richard Carlyle, but this scene it makes you like, oh he he speaks to to everything about Mary in this sequence where it's like, look, your, your parents have mm-hmm. fell in love because of like of of time. You and me, we can yeah. do that too. But I got money. You know mm-hmm. it. Let me take it out of my pocket and blow it and show it. Well, I almost think it's like a matter of uh, of just. Economy with the plot that Carlisle has to come in hot, make an impression because we don't see him actually in the season again until uh, uh, episode five. So he's gone for the next two episodes. So he needs to make an impression for when he comes back to be like, oh yeah, this guy, huh? You know, he's, so, he's a striking man. Kudos to Ian Glenn and his his, uh, his acumen with playing <laughs> Richard Carlisle. Yeah, and, and never ceases to, th- to thrill. I'd say. 
one of his many roles courting someone much younger than him. Sure, you know. <laughs> Man's got to eat. I don't know. Yeah. Um, anyways, where do we go next from here? Uh, we, we do see, I mean, to type all the loose ends with, with uh, Matthew and Mary and all that, um, he does have a moment with Robert. So let's tackle the Robert plot line, okay? Okay. <laughs> so uh, Robert, both of his footmen have gone to the war, and he remarks, all I'm left to do is just cut ribbons and make speeches. Mm-hmm. And Cora reminds him, well, keeping up spirits is, a, is an important thing, you know? It, it really matters. And Robert envies them. <laughs> these people going to war. Mm-hmm. So to contrast that for the listener, on the crown we saw Prince Phil, you know, feeling envious of these people who went to the moon. You know, these these special four men who got who got to be there, or three men, and then Robert envies people going to war and being involved in bloodshed and, and shooting guns and and death all around them. What is what kind of midlife crisis is this for Robert, Dave? Tell me what is going through his head. Is is he crazed? Does he does he have a a, a bloodlust? What is going on with I think Robert? It's, du- here? it's a sense of duty. Uh huh. That's it. That's okay. all. I mean, I don't think it's a sense that he wants to go die. You know, I don't think he's a. Well, I'm not saying he. Has, you don't you don't think he's got an itchy trigger finger? No, I don't think so. <laughs> It's just such a strange thing to envy. Like we already seen Thomas come back with his hand shot, and, mm-hmm. and Robert's just like, "Yes, give me that." Well, uh, he, he served too with Bates, right? And oh yeah, in the African War. So he's not. You know, this isn't the first time. It's not the like, first go round for him. Yeah, so he he just knows how important it is, and I think everyone we we also don't know what it's like to have a, a war on the level of a world war. I, I would just like to see a scene where like. Robert's in his side room, uh, uh, taking apart his M1 rifle, <laughs> and then reassembling it, cleaning it, like John ready Wick to or go. Like that. Yeah, I want to see that with Robert. <laughs> and then, and then, uh, yeah, just you know, crying to himself. Uh, yeah, I mean, so we later see that Robert is uh, looking like a boss smoking a cigar <laughs> with Matthew. He what looks is, so good in the scene. What does he say when? When? Oh. oh, oh. Uh, when Matthew comes back and <laughs> he walks in the room and the, they see, she's like, oh, my, my chap, good to see you. And he says, yeah. I'm still doing well. Touch wood. So I think touch wood is a, a British way of saying knock on wood. And he goes, touch mm-hmm. wood. And then Robert says, I've never stopped touching it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> really? <laughs> and he, and he, goes, <laughs> he looks at Matthew and he pats him on the butt. <laughs> You're making half that up. The, 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 half, half that did not happen. <laughs> the pat on the butt did not happen. But everything, he definitely does say, I never stop touching it. Touch wood. <laughs> I mean, that, that's Robert, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then Jane came in around the corner, you know, a few episodes later. Um, he, he tells Matthew, though, that he only gets to be a mascot. And, and, you know, Matthew tells him, you know, there's people here that are injured from the war who are praying for a bullet that kills them clean. <laughs> and Robert is just like Robert's like, well, it's time to get he time goes to his, gets his clean rifle. He said, "Let's off to yeah. work. We go." <laughs> I, I can be the executioner. Yes, I can do that job. I'm jolly good uh, fellow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but instead, it's not going to turn out that way for Down. It's not. It's not going to become an executioner home. It's going to be actually the opposite, um, because of the storyline involving Tom Barrow, a blind man. Yeah, um, and yeah, and Thomas. So we see earlier in the episode that mm-hmm. O'Brien puts a little whisper in, in Cora's ear that, like, hey, maybe at some point, like, Barrow could come work here? And Cora's like, I don't know. That doesn't seem okay. And then they somehow word gets to Clarkson, and he says, no, we don't, you know, we that's not something I can handle. Well, Cora puts in a word with Clarkson for him. Yeah, you know, and then like we that, see that that, work. that fails. So Cora, er, O'Brien talks to Cora again. Mm-hmm. And says like, why don't you get your your man to like do this? So Cora puts a word into Robert. Robert mm-hmm. is like, hey, y'all are doing this on my dime. If I want a, a my man back in town, I should get some perks. Mm-hmm. To which O'Brien wins. She gets Bar- yeah. Barrow shows up, and Ethel. And she's sees, actually happy to see him. She oh she she's is so- she is thrilled to see him. And, and the music's playing. I'm back, <laughs> better than ever. And, and yeah, you know, 
she's excited to see him. And as you were saying, Dave, Ethel's especially happy to see him. Ethel, yeah, Ethel's very happy to see him. Ethel's like, who's this handsome man outside? And O'Brien's like, eh, eh, that's mine. Yeah, I mean, did they have to go down that whole path of Ethel, like, you know, having a child and being single and struggling? I like Thirsty Ethel in this episode. I think we could have gotten a season two of her just being thirsty the whole time. Well, I think we I get like a half a season of her being thirsty. <laughs> I could do more. It, it's fun. It's fun to see her thirsty after after Thomas. And then uh, there's someone else in this episode, too, where she's just like, that guy, <laughs> you know? Well, when I love when, when Barrow shows up and mm-hmm. they're... Mr. Carson is like, they say, oh, Mr. Carson, look, we've got a visitor. And Carson just goes, I've seen him. Yeah. <laughs> don't don't need any more. He's got enough heart problems going on this issue. And, they, and then they say, he, Barrow says, hey, what happened to, to Mr. Bates? And like, oh, Mr. Bates is gone. And, and mm-hmm. he's like, well, not all the changes were bad. <laughs> hey, there, there you go. Uh, and I can't even remember exactly why Bates is gone. I think it has something to do with his wife to go take care of her, but... Bates ain't there. Uh, again, we've watched the show twice now. <laughs> it's hard to keep up, keep tabs on every single thing. Anyways, uh, yeah, Barrow is taking orders from Major Clarkson. Mm-hmm. So he's he's changing the sheets for for all the soldiers with, with Sybil. Sybil's there too. Yep, he was working alongside Sybil, and. Uh, he gets to know a blind man uh, on uh, in his bed. Indeed, indeed. What, what's that blind man's name? I, I don't even know. I, I just know he has a brother down. named. He has a brother named Jack. Is all, all I have. So Jack's brother is there. But he, he, yeah, he builds a, a bond with Thomas. Just them two talking it out mm-hmm. to get past you know the, the trauma of the war and being blind. Because he's like a mustard gas blind. Yep. Ain't coming back, probably. Yeah, very probably unfortunate. He's blind. And they're making progress. He doesn't have his bandages after a few scenes. He's, he's walking around outside, and Clarkson's like, you know what? You can adjust your condition at Farley Hall. You can, you can say goodbye. And the guy's like, please don't send me. I'm only just getting my act together. Clarkson's like, I don't care. Clarkson is like, I don't care. But Clarkson's also like, this is a world. This ain't, this ain't some militia down the road. This is a world war. We got a lot of bodies coming in, man. Yeah, you yeah, we're go, funneling a lot of people through going, the system. He says, we're not kicking you to the curb. We're kicking you to sending you somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And he goes, I like Lady yeah. Sybil and Mr. Barrow. They're my friends. I'm gonna, and, and Clarkson's like, dude, just come on. Be cool. Yeah. And then the guy kills himself. <laughs> he's, yeah, he, he's, he slits his uh, wrists. And, uh, yeah, barely any time to digest that he's being moved to another another hall. He just offs himself right there because he doesn't want to leave. Thomas and Sybil, I guess. Um, and then we see vintage Thomas crying. Uh, Thomas Barrow crying as, a, as we, <laughs> we've we become familiar with throughout the, the series. Mm-hmm. And they don't linger too long on him crying before we hear uh, Clarkson billowing in, must have smuggled a razor blade into his bag. <laughs> and it's like, whoa, <laughs> we were just watching Thomas cry. And then it's just smash cut to Clarkson like he had the razor blade there's nothing we could have done he's dead I think rewatching this done. episode it that there's, there's a lot more absurdity to that s- sequence this subplot than I remember because it, it's, it's mm-hmm. something that you have to be obviously PTSD is addressed very heavily in this episode uh-huh. and we're not given a timeline but we're given a, f- mm-hmm. a few interactions between Barrow and this guy and you know, is there something a little further with the way he puts his hand on Barrow's thigh? You know, there's there's questions asked. He's blind, man. Yeah, I don't but, know. But, <laughs> hey, Barrow's balling when the guy dies. There's a lot of casualties of war. Not all of them make Tom Barrow cry. Yeah. But it is one of those things. If this is like three days, mm-hmm. it's really not, it, it's it truly hey, he's in is a fragile an overreaction. State, maybe, maybe. But I if mean, this is a week, if this is two weeks, then maybe. I think. Well, no, I think this episode is multiple weeks. I think we're supposed to believe that because we have the tell of the beginning of the episode, William receives the letter that he's being called to the war. Uh And then by the end of the episode, he's back from training. And I can't imagine training is just like two or three days exactly, you know. So, But at the same time, Richard Carlyle arrives in the middle of the episode and leaves in the end of the episode. And with... Yeah, he was there for a week maybe. 
Who knows? It's a long week for a guy who works in the newspaper <laughs> industry. <laughs> Could have been. Who knows? Who knows? Regardless, way, I feel though, like the, the, the subplot when you when you put it under a microscope, it's a little more questionable than it is uh, purely emotionally reward or riveting mm-hmm. in the way that it is on a first watch. I think. Sure. Anyways, so th- this death, uh, you know, indicates to Matthew that you know they need to do more uh, with with Downton. To or, Matthew? Uh, not to Matthew. I don't know who who is it. It comes with the bright idea. It's like a combination of him talking with Sybil, and, and you know, they, I think they. Yeah, I think it's a big. It mostly Sybil, I would say. Yeah, they they have the idea that they can turn Downton into its own you know hospice. And you know, with the war going on, there's no well, way they can hospice, say no. Not a place to rehab, a place to rehab not a place to die. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking of what Robert would do. <laughs> oh, more men! <laughs> Whoa, Robert, calm down there. Um, so the Dowager is absolutely against it. She forbids it. And then Cora comes in and says, uh, uh, uh. "It's my house. Welcome to my house." Play that music uh, too loud. Dowager. Yeah, shuts down the Dowager, and they're going to turn down into a, a recovery place. So yeah, there you have it. We also see a couple scenes of like Branson has to go give Sybil lunch, and we see Sybil. Mm-hmm. Sybil has never felt more important and useful in her life. She's also yeah, like eighteen I years believe. old, so that totally makes sense. You got a job with sure. responsibility. Yeah. Uh, in terms of other World War One stuff going on in this episode, we have the new servant, Mister Lang. <laughs> but I think he was, was he in episode one. Uh, I, I think. Either way, he's no. still new to us no, right he, now. He's replacing uh, Bates. Oh, okay. And he's uh This he's he's very interesting. I mean, he's only here for like two episodes. Yeah, but he he pulls out some side of uh, O'Brien. O'Brien is sympathetic towards him in the in the beginning of the episode. She's kind of, she tells him not Thanks. to polish his shoe, uh, Lord Grantham's shoes at the kitchen table because Mr. Carson doesn't like the smells. And by the mm-hmm. end of the episode, she's like, oh, you have a skill when he's sewing. And he's like, yeah, yeah. I, got, I got skills. You got a problem with skills? And, and O'Brien's like, no, I think that's great. And then when he has that shell shock after the the scene the with gravy the gravy, spell. We, we see him and in, in, in the director of this episode, Ashley Pierce, decides it's a good idea to put in sounds of bullets. As he just well, that's actually just Robert practicing his firing outside. He's, he's oh, just yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, shooting off. Uh, and, 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 but, we, uh, and O'Brien's like, I've been around shell shock people before, and I understand you, and I feel mm-hmm. bad. And yeah. he's like, all right. And this is, this is the first episode with Lang. So, you know, this is our introduction to him, and I'm sure he'll be around for a lot more episodes. I wish he would uh, be. I think he's a very complicated character. He's good. Yeah, he's interesting. There's a lot to un- unpack there, I think. But that's pretty much it. One pretty one note in, in a lot of ways, but representative of what was going on during that time period, I guess. Yeah. You know, so it's good to capture that. Also representative of what was going on in that time period was uh, what Pat Moore's dealing with. Yeah. Her sister's boy has gone missing. Oh, Archibald Philpulse. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, she actually gets a moment to tell Robert to you know reach out for Archie. You know, the the worst well, uh, like outcome Hughes is he's, tell, he gets a recommendation like go to go to Lord Grantham and talk to him. And they're like, I don't know. This is Pat Moore. And Robert playing. like barely even like looks at her. He's just like, you know, he's probably dead, right? <laughs> like he's just like looking over his shoulder, like why why are you bothering me? You know, we, we ain't going to find him. And it turns out he is dead. But not by the other uh, the by the enemy's hand exactly. No, he was shot for cowardice. He tried to run away. Mm-hmm. And, and, and this is uh, a good this is a good play from Robert where he's like, Don't tell anybody about this. This stays here. I'm walking away. Miss O'Brien, come be be the friend. I'm Mr. Popular around here. As much as I'd like to be a shoulder to cry on, Richard Carlisle's upstairs. I got a and, yep. and my, my fairy tale boy is upstairs. I got I yeah. got people to see. Cigars to smoke, yep. if you will. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he pretty much just drops that bombshell. And, uh, Pat Moore's left to deal with it. Mm hmm. And we don't, I, I mean, I, I guess, I, do they, I don't know if they make much of this plot, but. Archie? I mean, that happened. 
Yeah. Yeah, this is a huge thing with with Archie. With the plaque where they don't know if Mrs. Patmore oh, really right. wants to have the name on the on the. Oh my gosh, I forgot about that whole people. business. I think I just blacked that out in my memory. That's a good plot. Mr. Carson is the the guy in, tra- and that's a really good Robert yeah. moment where he he's the one that sort of does the nice thing for his his staff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, he's more than a mascot in that moment, and it's, it's a bit of like, you know, a moment for Robert to like see like he can be more than just the mascot. There's maybe more he can. Can do well, here. that's at the very end of the war, so he's already done. Right. Yeah, yeah. This is pretty much all he does for the next like two or three years. Um. So I think that's all the stuff that's going on with the war in this episode. Yeah, I think there's only really two more things to talk about, right? Yeah. Uh, and one of those <laughs> is Mosley. <laughs> Another thing, I, I remember us discussing this plot last time we did this episode. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's not good. Uh, so not he a, shows not good, up. Not a noble look from Mosley. Like, we want to talk about, <laughs> this is bad. Yeah. I mean, Bates has only been gone for like a hot second, and Mosley shows up like, hey, where's Anna at? I want to talk to her. <laughs> okay, so he's been gone for six months. Mm-hmm. And he wants to leave a, a book with Anna. Well, I mean, six months... That's a fair amount of time, but at the same time, I don't know. I wouldn't. Do I, at it. least I wouldn't he's trying it. to shoot a shot. It, it just seems like he, he uh, Julian's trying to to fill up the minutes for this episode. This is something that's never touched on again. It doesn't add up to much. It only just lets you know that Anna still has something burning for Bates that we don't even need to really you know see reemphasize. We already know. Um, he leaves a book for Anna. Comes back, asks if she read the book, and she's like, "You left it with me yesterday," <laughs> and. Uh, he's like, well, you, would you want to talk about this book sometime? And she's like, I'd rather do it in a book club setting. And he's just like, man, I can't get anywhere with this girl. Mm-hmm. And then they have that, that he comes back again. And he's like, hey, like, what's going on? And she's like, if it's about that book, <laughs> I didn't read it. And he's, Stop. He's like, <laughs> he's like, I know what Mr. Bates got. And she's like, look, you, you know what love is like? It's like a child. She compares Bates to a child. She compares the love of Bates to a missing child, to losing a child. And we, I guess. We said last <laughs> week, explain why Bates is an in- attractive man. And in the Lords of Grantham Lounge, Haley said he's a brooder's brood. People like brooders. Women like I bro- actually, brooders. I see a little bit more in what Anna's saying here about comparing him, you know, to like missing a child. Bates has a bit of the the chubby cheek syndrome that you see in babies. <laughs> so he's a, ba- he's, he's a got baby. a little, he's got a bit of a baby face, you no, know, when you think about no, it. He does not. Just in those cheeks, those cheeks are absolutely baby cheeks. Sure. So I can see where he's, he's baby a, Bates. That's all I'm saying, baby Bates. We know, <laughs> season six, we get baby Bates. In the movie, we get baby Bates, toddler Bates. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and that's all you got to say about this plot line. I mean, she kind of leaves Mosley there, and he, we don't really understand Mosley's reaction to it. He's just like, well, I guess that's that, you know? It's like, bum, 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 bum. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Mosley. You played Left yourself. to be single for eternity. <laughs> well, maybe in movie two he won't be. Maybe. We'll see. Yes. Uh, Speaking of single. Yeah. <laughs> and And thirsty. Edith, <laughs> this is what we wanted to watch the episode for. Uh, she saw that Miss Drake in the village needs help, and you know needs a, to find an able-bodied man. And she thinks maybe I can go help them. You know, they need someone to drive a tractor, and, and she could drive it. Mm-hmm. And uh, what, what was it? I think um, does Robert say it or Mary say it? You're a lady, not a toad of toad uh, hall. <laughs> the, I believe the dowager says that. Mm. Great dowager quip. She's yeah. not a toad at, at all, but she's well, like, well, I'm I mean, doing it. It's it, it, Mr. Toad. Yeah, she, she, Mr. She, toad she, with yeah, his she, car. She's she's she thinking he's being like the like the the fairy tale or whatever it is. What, who? What's this fairy tale, Mr. Toad? Mr. What, toad. what are you talking about? You never seen the Disney adaptation, Mr. To- the the Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. I have no idea what you're talking about right now. You've never to- Toad of Toad Hall, 1908, The Wind in the Willows. The Wind in the Willows is a different different thing. It's it's one of the main characters in the 1908 novel. Oh, the Wind Mr. In the Toad Willows. in the Willow. 
Okay. So toad of toad. We just lost listeners with that 45 seconds just trying to figure out what we were talking about. (laughs) All right. All right. right. Anyways, Edith is not a toad, and she's driving up to (laughs) to this farm. She Uh, gets put to use. She's she's helping move stumps. Yeah, she can drive the tractor. And and we see this Mr. Drake. The guy never looks like he's bathed in in a week or so. He, he, He looks... I think the one thing that we need to remember with Mr. Drake was he almost died last season. Was he in last season? He's the episode with the dropsy. And so what episode is that? Oh, yeah, that's the, right. I, where right. he almost dies and it's Isabel's call mm-hmm. to, to bring him back from the, you know, like, this is what he has. Do this. And she's right. And it's. Uh, oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and he, he's saved. So, yeah, he's here working on his farm, and he's not up to full strength yeah, yet. Because at, so. at Lord Grantham is like, is he healthy enough? I thought he was healthy enough after a scare last yeah. year. So. Well, we see that reflected in this episode by how dirty he looks, uh, how yellow his teeth is. He, he's not he's not an attractive man necessarily, this Mr. Drake. No, he looks like a like a, like a a Laurel and Hardy background character with his hats and stuff like that. He's, he is not mm-hmm. great, not great if you ask me. Yeah, and and so they get Edith to pull a tree stump out of the ground. Congratulations! Mm-hmm. <laughs> so and they celebrate by by drinking, drinking a and eating bit. bread, drinking out of a bottle, drink whatever it is out of a bottle, soda or and e- yeah. And Edith, you know, ever the charmer asks, "Did you plant that tree?" And he's just like, "The tree that size? Do you know how long it takes to grow trees in that size? It's like forty years old." He's like, "My dad. How did after it. are you? My dad did it." Yeah, but they, yeah, they take a sip of something strong, and Miss Drake brings a big old roll, and they're they're all getting along. They, they, everything's harmonious, it mm-hmm. seems like. And then we see Edith goes back, and Edith mm-hmm. is like, "Hey, you want me to dri- teach you to drive that t- tractor?" And Mister Drake is like, "Nah, because if you can drive it, mm-hmm. I I I got no need for you to come here anymore, and I'd I'd hate for you to stay away." And that just has Edith thinking, "He thinks my tractor's sexy." Oh, I know. It really turns it turns them on. <laughs> They're always staring at him, at her, you know, as she's tugging along. <laughs> hey, uh, you said it. I'm, I'm just saying. She, he thinks her tractor's sexy, so uh, he says again, "Let's have a rest. We earned it." And they have another bottle. <laughs> says tells her she's pretty clever and fine. Mm-hmm. And he's saying we could always have a midnight feast. And this is where I think it illuminates a lot. It's definitely Mr. Drake making the moves on Edith here a little bit. He goes 70% of the way. She comes 30% of the way. So really, can we say, is it fair that Edith is a homewrecker? I know it takes two to tangle. She caused, but she is caused it, the cheat. She didn't, she's not the cheater. She caused the cheat. She's the cause of it? Yeah. Uh, no, we're seeing that Drake is definitely the cause of the cheat. <laughs> no, Drake is the cheater. He's the one who's, whose relationship is being cheated upon. Mm-hmm. Edith is the cause. I guess. I mean, if not her, anyone could have been, you know? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, is anyone that naive and, and needy? No, that is true. You have to be Mrs. a rare Drake form of naive Drake is a very friendly and nice person. And all the experiences. I, I When she shows <laughs> I, up, I'm like, oh, this lady's she's adorable. I like Mrs. Drake. It kills me when, when like, you see the two of them getting on, um, Mr. Drake and, and Edith, uh, on the back of a wagon. And she's pops her head like from behind the wagon like she was there the entire time like what are you two doing get back to work get back to plowing <laughs> yeah she definitely is much and, b- much uh better looking than him he, he she's out of his league absolutely yeah he, he's dating up uh but she sees the two of them snogging she catches it's them in, up. in the, it's like the a, light it's the most well-directed shot in the episode they're right in the doorway and she sees it and she mm-hmm. just is like come on john come on and it's funny because we're running out of time in this episode, and I'm like, wait, does this plotline carry over? Like, I, I don't remember, like, if it wraps up here or not, and lo and behold, it does. She just writes a letter. She's like, hey, we got a guy. Yeah, stay away. She goes, he's, and my husband's we sleeping just see in the Edith. barn. Yeah, he's sleeping definitely in the barn under some hay. Uh, and we see Edith just looking distraught. <laughs> I mean, what does she think is going to happen? Edith, this is, this is not a good, it's not a good look on, on Edith's part. That's... That's the worst thing about this whole thing is that Edith is upset that she's being torn apart from this thing. You know, when it's like, you wanted to pursue this, you wanted to keep this going. 
At what point, where do you think this ends up? Like, come on, Edith. Like, why, why make her look that way, you know? She, this, this is like one of those hallmark episodes of why people can't stand Edith. It's because of her, you know, being part of this and wanting to be a part of a home wrecking situation and then complain about her dress getting gravy on it. You yeah, know, no one cares about your dress. Bad look for Edith. It's not even a pretty dress, Edith. I'm sorry. You, you, you glow up at one point. This ain't it. Yeah, well, that's it. So that, that's it and that's all. Uh, I don't think Edith is entirely at fault. I think we've dragged her way too much for what goes on this ep- uh, in this episode. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, not not her finest moment. I'm, I'm glad we will watch it again. Yeah, it, this is a good episode to watch for many reasons. And in in our, just like with with uh, Kieran and just like with the wedding, there's always more mm-hmm. that keeps us satisfied about these Downton Abbey episodes. And this is another one where every, I think everything else overshadowed Edith and her mm-hmm. uh, bad decisions. For sure. Well, in terms of the power rankings, I got Mr. Carson going down at number three. He's got something going on. We don't know what, <laughs> but it ain't good. I, 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 can't, I can't justify that because we don't know what it is, and we know it's not a heart attack. And like you said, he, okay. he kips up. He's good. He's back. Maybe it was a nasty deuce, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a food baby. <laughs> At number three, yeah. going now, I got I got Mosley. It's a he's he. It's a bad bad look for him to shoot his shot the way he does. He doesn't take the hint initially, and no, mm-hmm. there's nothing that anyone who has a, a crush on somebody is more heartbreaking than having that person tell you like no, outright. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, and it, it right. foreshadows That's fair. years of of sadness for for old. Mm-hmm. John or Joe Mosley, Mosley. whatever his name is. Uh, at number two, I got Edith for the reasons we just discussed. It's, it's not a, a great episode for her. I got at Mrs. All. Drake at number two. Really? You feel bad for her? Yeah. Okay. She, you know, we see it first that the husband, it's like, imagine, it's like my husband has a friend and it's this person in high power in the town. You know, he almost died last year. This is a. This is pretty big for us. This could be a good thing, you know, if he learns to drive this tractor. This is going to be great. And then he, he mm-hmm. she brings out food for Edith. She feeds Edith. She gives Edith farm clothes. And then yeah. she's like, what is my man doing out there? Uh-uh. Mm-hmm. It's not that. That's her husband. That's Edith. Who yeah. cares about Edith? Well, well for, for that reason, I got Mr. Drake at go, number one going down. The, the guy, <laughs> he's a cheater. Once a cheater, always a cheater, as my mom said. So, no good, Mister Drake. He looks dirty. Okay, I mean, Mister Drake. Mister Drake is in the doghouse. He got to snog as someone from high society. He's he got his, uh, some yard work done. <laughs> I think it could be. It's worse for <laughs> Mister Drake than Mister Drake. <laughs> could be worse. Yeah. Well, number one going down. You know, it's Mister Barrow for me. Uh, I don't know. He gets to come back home. But at what cost? We see. I think his he. We see he doesn't connect with people, and this is he, yeah. he connects with somebody, and that guy barely knows. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's sad. Yeah. Well, I I, I wish they would have spent more time on him crying. Then then I would have bought in. Uh, but so it goes. Yeah. Well, Who, who's going up for and, you? And, and Carson straight up swats him down in an epic takedown from Carson. Yeah. I already saw him going up. That's true. Mm-hmm. Welcome to Downton Abbey, Richard Carlisle. <laughs> okay. He comes in, and everyone's like, I don't know about this guy. I don't know about this guy. And mm-hmm. he's like, I'm new money. <laughs> Every time you see him, he walks in the room, and he goes, hi, I'm new money. New money, Richard. You know me. New money, Richard yeah. Carlisle over here. And then sure. at the end of the episode, that, that, that promo he cuts about being a power Powerful. couple, and then walks away. He says, I'll see you in a couple, in a, a couple of months. Think yeah. about me. And he disappears in the cloud it's of smoke. Good. It's great. Yeah. Well, number three, I got William. And I, I we barely even touched on this, actually. <laughs> There's the plot in this episode of him trying to make Daisy his girl. This is actually probably the most problematic thing in the whole episode. And that uh, one of, of the series where Daisy has to lie to him about, you know, making him feel good and stuff. It, it's so wrong where he's just like, can I get your photo to, to think of you during the war? And it's like, you creep. What are you gonna do with that photo, bro? Just look at her and just think about it. You get out of here, man. She she's just a coworker, man. That's gross. I know it's a different time. 
It's, it's not, but it's not pure. Well, it's like if you like, lived. It's like if you lived with all your coworkers. Yeah, it's weird. And, it is, and then he comes it is back. Unusual. And she doesn't even really formally agree to it. And he comes back and he's like, "Can I get a Swiss from my my sweetheart? A, a kiss from my sweetheart?" And it's like, "No, who are you?" <laughs> and it's so I'm weird. William, it's so man. it's so like uh, presumptive on his part. And his skin is so pasty, and it just disturbs me too. The, and his uniform doesn't sunshine. fit well. He's he, no. He's William's kind of a dud. I don't like William. I mean, I like his dad a lot better than I like William. Oh yeah, yeah. His dad is absolutely. His dad has a lot more chemistry with Daisy than, than he does, for sure. Yeah. For so who's number two, Dave? I gotta I gotta give credit where credit is due. It's o- O'Brien. She she went. Okay. She does work in this episode. She gets what she mm-hmm. wants. She she. It's twofold. It's twofold because number one, she's she's gets Bates not Bates Barrow back. By just mm-hmm. sort of whispering, she's like, "Hey, why don't you try to do this? Hey, why don't you do? Th- why don't you do this?" And then Barrow comes back, and she gets her way, and she's thrilled. We never see her happy; she's happy. And then mm-hmm. I think she, her taking sympathy for Mister Lang is one of the only purely good moments that O'Brien has in the whole show and her whole run. Okay, that, that's fair. Well, I got Sybil at number uh, two. And that's pretty much just because she has, you know, part of that idea for for turning down Abby into the hospital. Okay. So, you know, big ups to her, and she's found her job. She says she's never going back to her old life. She's found a new place for herself. Good for her. For that reason, I have Sybil at number one. Okay. That's it. It's all you said. It all. She's she's the. This is the best Sybil. I you know she's working. She's proud of herself. Mm-hmm. She gets her way over her grandmother. It's good. It's a good Sybil episode. Yeah. Well. Number one, Dave, for all the reasons you described earlier, it's Carlisle at number one. The guy just makes such an impression in this episode. He is just laying it on thick, just, you know, shooting threes every chance he gets. <laughs> the guy's on fire. <laughs> this is uh, an Emmy, Emmy-worthy appearance. I mean, it's the thing where it gets you excited for his next appearance because it's like he's got to come back. And you wait one episode, you wait another episode, and then when he shows back, it shows up again. It's like, ah, this guy. You know, he, does you know he's from New Money? He's a self-made man. Did you know that? Just a little bit of New Money. Yeah, he's one of the Migos. He's got a bunch of New Money. Um, and just to look at my rankings from last time, I had Car- Carlisle at number one last time, too. Uh, at William that. at number two, and then Matthew at number three last time. Yeah, I mean, Matthew gets a, a vacation, but he doesn't want it. Yeah. Down last time, I had Dowger at number one. Yeah. Edith at number two. Thomas at three. And then Carson out of the honorary four spot. Are we, I mean, Carson, Carson, we don't know what happened. We don't know exactly. We don't know. So that's this week. That was that was a good episode. That was worthwhile. Yeah, I'm glad we did it. Yeah, and I know last week I asked, you know, because when uh, Thomas Barrow went to go interview at that that manor that was all musty and just dank looking inside, mm-hmm. I asked, why is it so dirty? Why are the walls so dirty? And our, our listener Maria on Instagram uh, let us know that. Back then, they used to burn candles on the walls, which is what creates that kind of soot, you know, that that gets around on all the walls everywhere. So that's why it looked dirty there, because it's one of these old manors, and it just just hasn't been cleaned up since they've been using all those those candles back then. So that explains that for anyone that was curious. Great, that's that. Yeah, I'm sure everyone was know. curious. Yep. So Dave, what have you been watching, man? What's what's new with you? It, today's the day. It's Cinco de Mayo. It's Wednesday on mm-hmm. Netflix. It's the circle finale. I gotta watch it. We gotta wrap up. Yeah. I gotta go turn it on. Have we talked about it on here? I think the we talked about the, the last season of the circle. Yeah, we haven't talked about season two. It's been good. It's been very good. It's, I don't know if it's as good as season one. No, it's not as heartwarming as season one was. Yeah, well, season one is. I think season one has more lovable characters from the beginning. This one has a lot of conniving characters in the beginning. Absolutely, and I think it still does have a lot of conniving characters. Uh, just it's way more tactical. I, I like when people are just being themselves and just learning that they actually like each other. You know, mm-hmm. that, that that's the thing about the show. So the concept of the show for people who need a reminder, uh, they have these online personas. These people are are sanct- are quartered off into a house. They never get to meet each other, and all they have are these online personas where they can engage with each other. Now some are catfishing, and they're pretending to be certain people. Uh, you know, I don't know why exactly. They just think it's easier for them to get along with people as these fake 
characters or it's mm-hmm. more fun. Well, it's a, they want to win. They think the best way to win money is to be someone who's more attractive, someone who's younger, and that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. So it's people just engaging and voting on par- popularity contests to get ahead. Uh, this time around, there was a bit more strategy where people were aligning with each other. And today is the season finale. So definitely watching that as soon as we're done here. Absolutely. That's, that's what's happening. That's absolutely what's happening. Uh, have you watched anything else, Dave? Uh, a little bit more Sopranos. That's, you know, slowly. Okay. I'm, I'm behind. Yeah. I've had a, a busy couple of weeks. The world is getting back mm-hmm. to normal. My, you know, our weekends are starting to look a little better as far as socializing yeah. and stuff. So it's uh, not too much. What about you? Yeah. I don't think I ever covered it on this podcast, but, you know, that Korean drama I was watching, I, I wrapped it up a, a few weeks ago mm-hmm. where each episode is about 70 to 90 minutes. Uh, and it was so good. I, I just got to say, Crash Landing on you on Netflix, if you really want your drama, if you really want to, you know, revel in some drama, every episode is full of it. And it's a it's a trope of a lot of these K-dramas to have a really sad or, or you know, heart-wrenching ending. And this doesn't quite go all the way there but it really gets you in the gut but it, it's 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 felt it's good it's it's good it it's just a good story of two people falling for each other even though everything says they shouldn't and can't mm. and they do and it, it's just it's so lovable i i know people I, I know of someone who watched has watched it five times i don't know how you do that i know another person who did it twice I don't know how you find the time to do that. Well, we, but, our, uh, our, our fans in the Lords of Grantham Lounge are talking about just constant rewatches of that one. I don't know how you do it. I can't. I like, and this just speaks to me in general with TV and stuff. I like to, I like to eat, and then or not eat. Well, I do like to eat, but like, I like to just have my sampling. Call it a day. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm full. You mm-hmm. know. Yeah, I've never been a big binger. I definitely did watch three episodes of The Circle in a row last week. And that felt exhausting. It felt <laughs> terrible. Oh, man, it was bad. I was like, okay, no it's good. Too much of the sugar. Yeah. It's just not, we're not cut out that way, you know? No, <laughs> no, we're old, old school. We're not that new new money. No, we're, we're not, not that, that new money. We like new to. Bingers. Yeah, we're, we're, we want to we watch like to one wait. I Love Lucy a week. And, and that's the thing is like, you know, I see all these TV shows and it's like, you know, what, I'm just going to throw on a movie. <laughs> I just don't want to keep up with some TV right now. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, and that's where we are in life. And just like that, right. well, speaking of throwing on movies, um, mm-hmm. on our Patreon upstairs tier, we cover the 2005 Pride and Prejudice. And yeah. it's a good one. I know we're still working out the kinks on how to deliver the Patreon episodes now that we're on a new podcast server. But we're trying mm-hmm. to get something super duper streamlined. So I think this Pride and Prejudice is a lot more uh, silly and fun than our coverage of the BBC series because we already know the story. So. Yep. We are just sort of leaning into comparing it and, and poking fun at it and appreciating it and all that stuff. So, yeah. That's $5 a it's, month. It's, it's good. It's a, it's a good listen. And it's a good Yeah, movie. especially if you know Pride and Prejudice. It's just us talking about it. So, yeah. That's out there. And, yeah, you know where to find us Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We have our Lords of Grantham Podbean website. If you want to go check that out, mm-hmm. uh, leave a rating and review if you so choose on iTunes uh, we got the merch out there you can find a link to that on the website now alongside our Twitter uh, You can f- and you can also find us on Patreon too so we're everywhere and nowhere people indeed yeah so we'll see you so, next uh, week c- keep holding on to that wood I guess I yeah, don't know keep touching, touching wood never stop touching wood <laughs> never stop